This is a huge story for uh, for Sri Lanka. Of course, many Sri Lankans live call Singapore home, and uh, it is one that has been percolating for many, many weeks. We are very lucky to have with us right now on the line uh, from Sri Lanka, somebody who knows who's been following this, uh, Dil Rukshi Handanetti, who's the executive director for the Center for Investigative Reporting in Sri Lanka, an investigative reporter, a commentator. Uh, Dil Rukshi, welcome to the show. So happy to have you with us today. Thank you, Glenn, and thank you, Neil. Wonderful to be with you. Uh, Dilrukshi, tell us, we'll, we'll get to what's going on in here in Singapore in a minute, but tell us what has led up to where we are this weekend in Sri Lankan politics. Uh, how, how far back do we have to go to, to set the stage for this story? Um, at least a few months when people started uh, protesting. Uh, people have been consistently protesting, but what usually doesn't get the media's uh, attention is the fact that it was the Sri Lankan farmers who started protesting, demanding uh, chemical fertilizer. So there was a presidential decision to ban, ban the imports, uh, importing of uh, chemical fertilizer. So this affected about 2 million Sri Lankan farmers. So, but this was not the sexy story. This wasn't uh, what was getting the international headlines. But eventually, the lack of democracy, issues of accountability, youth unrest, people who want to see not only regime change, but a very systematic change in the country politically, uh, gathered in, ma in very many places. And there is a, a place called Gota Gogama, which means you know the place from where Gota should exit. And he has exited from there. So um, massive protests have been uh, held for the past four months. And eventually, the president has been driven out of office. Yeah, I would I mean, say he you, was driven out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, looking from the outside, if you look at the timeline, there almost feels a sense of inevitability because you go back, as you mentioned, to the 1st of April. That was when they declared a temporary state of emergency. And I'm just going through some of the things here. 10th of April, doctors say they're running out of life saving medicines. Uh, 12th of April, they default on their foreign debt of 51 billion. So it's building and building and building until it literally reaches the president's house compound and swimming pool. Was this just months in the making or was it years in the making? Did, did domestically and internationally, did we all take our eye off the ball when it came to Sri Lanka? I think there was an economic meltdown and this is linked to also the COVID-19 pandemic, its impacts on the economy, the loss of tourism, our balance of payment crisis, all of that combined. So it was building up for a number of years, I would say. But the escalation, as you said, uh, Neil, happened in the past few months when people really felt pressurized because Sri Lanka is not really used to not having fuel and gas. We haven't, I mean, in my entire lifetime, I haven't seen uh, you know, people queuing up for these essentials. So it's really new. And if you uh, notice that the queues are really long, P uh, you know, med medicine is not in short supply, food, uh, certain food items are in short supply, and gas and fuel queues are really, really long. And people have to stand in queues for two to three days and beyond. So, and also you don't know when they arrive and we people don't really have the patience to sit and think that you have to pay for these consignments, right? You just cannot get gas supplies. You cannot yeah. get uh, fuel without, you know, if you don't have cash, how do you pay? And then this is really the economic crisis that we are, you know, the dollar crisis is what we are really experiencing. And I don't think people have the patience to now absorb that and understand that you've got many more months of this mm, to endure. It is a it is a, a disaster that has been in the making, as you say, for many months now. We're talking with Dilrukshi Handanetti, the executive director of the Center for Investigative Reporting. Uh, Dilrukshi, I had the pleasure of, uh, of introducing you, uh, your award that you got last month, uh, a Journalist of Courage and Impact Award at the East-West Center's uh, biennial media conference, international media conference in Honolulu. And at that time, uh, giving you that award um, and then listening to you on several panels in the, in the days before and after, it just struck me um, how helpless so many people in Sri Lanka are against what is perceived to be government incompetence. Um, is, is that the right way to put it? Is it incompetence? Is it perceived corruption? What is it 
about Sri Lanka in the past, let's say six months or a year, that has led to this crisis in, in, from what you believe as an investigative journalist? I think it is incompetence largely because that's what really impacts the large majority of the people. But if I were to respond to you as a journalist was, you know, watching him for a number of years uh, since his days as defense secretary and, and, you know, all of this, I think there were allegations of large scale corruption and huge nepotistic, uh, you know, approach that he had in his government. All of these things. That you're, you're referring deficit, to the president, the, the former president. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So all these things combined, you know, at a point, Glenn, you can't differentiate between, you know, the economic meltdown, the democracy, the, the, the deficit in democracy and so many other things. They all combined and become became a huge force in Sri Lanka. So I think all these elements contributed, but the economic factor overrode anything else. And now you have an interim president who I believe is the the, the, the former prime minister so there's a direct connection to the former presidency anyway so there's a lot of skepticism that the new guy isn't going to last long either because it's still very much tied to the old regime uh, what are your thoughts on that i wouldn't want to speculate but at the same time i think he's uh, prime minister the acting president uh, mm -hmm. Ranil Vikram Singh has been one of, you know, a seasoned politician who has survived this game for a long time. And a lot of people, while they do not like him, also see him as a political survivor who has waited for 20, 28 years to get to presidency. This is how he's seen in Sri Lanka. Um, you're right, there would be different candidates. And uh, today, parliament will be convened this morning and uh, nominations will be called for the, uh, the post of president. And on the 19th, there will be an election and the timeline is such that on the 20th, there will be a new president for Sri Lanka to uh, to give leadership to an interim all party government. So this is an interim arrangement uh, as far as we understand. But uh, given the dynamics, given how the Sri Lankan politics has been in the past few days, it's also very different. You know, it's difficult also to predict because constitutionally it is also possible for a president once appointed to continue for the you know remainder of that period that uh, Godabe Rajapaksha has not completed. So uh, it would open up very interesting options for us to see. But uh, I think people's protests will continue to keep them under pressure. And any deviation from uh, what was agreed to on 9th of July uh, as an interim arrangement, if you breach it, I think there will be uh, further collapse, further chaos, even possibly, unfortunately, there could even be violence because people will hit the streets all over again. Yeah, well, that was going to be my follow-up question, uh, Dilrukshi. Changing personnel, different election, yes, but changing names, can you fix the blackouts? Can you fix the acute food and fuel shortages? Can you fix the supply chain crisis? These are issues that are not just domestic, they have international bearings as well. How much change can you realistically expect from a new regime? It's going to be a Herculean task. I don't think we can underestimate the kind of task that is before him and uh, in anyone who's getting elected and the interim government. It's going to be a huge task to uh, ensure that supplies are there and supplies are in place. You know, because people's patients have really run out. And so you have to ensure that people have their gas and uh, people have uh, food supplies and medicine. Because this, the, it's all systems collapse nail right now in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't even get out, for example. I, I mean, I'll, I'll have to think about how am I going to prudently use my fuel quota because I don't want to, you know, have that, you know, queue, queuing up experience uh, all over again. So uh, it's yeah. really a difficult one. Um, having said that, I think the international community does expect the Sri Lankan government, the incoming interim administration, to come up with a real action plan. If you just talk politics, it's really not going to work because we've been politicking for 70 plus years, but that doesn't help. You really need uh, a, a forward plan and, and timelines and sticking to it and avoid playing politics with, uh, you know, with 22 million people's lives. Yeah, we're talking with Dilrukshi Handanetti, Executive Director of the Center for Investigative Reporting, award-winning uh, investigative reporter. Dilrukshi, now let's get to the, the topic that we have all seen here uh, up, up close, which is the former president, uh, Gotabaya 
Rajapaksa uh, arriving in Singapore on Thursday. Uh, the Singapore police said he has not asked for asylum. He has not been given asylum. He is here on a, what they're calling a private visit. Uh, that's according to the Singapore police and the, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, what, what does it mean to the people of Sri Lanka that he and his wife very much just sort of skipped out of town, got on their private jet, and away they were going? Uh, is that, has it made people actually happy to be rid of him, or are they angry? They want him back to hold him to account. Uh, what, what are people feeling about the fact that he's parked somewhere, uh, one would assume, in a luxury hotel here in Singapore? What a question, Glenn. It's a difficult one also because I, he, uh, he um, took a military jet along with his wife to mm -hmm. uh, reach, uh, uh, to reach uh, Maldives. And then mm -hmm. on the Saudi Arabian flight, which is considered the world's most tracked flight in real time, right? The journey from uh, Valana International to Singapore was the most tracked uh, flight. And uh, this does uh, give us an indication as to the kind of international attention he was ge getting or his journey was getting. Because he yeah. was a president who was fleeing the country. He was still the president when he left the island. So yeah. uh, to respond to how people, res uh, people see that, I think uh, we have uh, different opinions on this. Some people actually think it's a good thing that he's left the country because mm. that if he, if they, if uh, President Rajapaksha was in Sri Lanka. There could be further political manipulation, and you know there would still he would still be working with the political parties to you know strike a deal somehow stay uh, retain power. So the, uh, that is one school of thought. The others think that it is good that he has you know departed Sri Lanka. But they are, what is what what does not make them happy is the fact that how certain countries have welcomed him. And I don't think it's it's for us to comment on that because uh, it's about diplomacy, it's about international relations, and it's also about reciprocity and how countries respond. Having said that, there was this huge you know there were a lot of speculation and then extremely negative response when he arrived in Maldives. And, mm -hmm. and the facilitator, uh, the Maldivian facilitator, who is Mohammed Nasheed, who is also the speaker of uh, the Maldivian parliament, who is also a close friend of Sri Lanka. Mm. What they did not expect from Singapore was for Sri, uh, you know, the possibility of Singapore turning into a safe haven. But then we all know you can stay for 30 days. You know, you, you, you just you get on arrival visa. There are a lot of facilities that you, people can do this. And he's on, apparently on a private visit. But, but, but sure. would the Sri Lankan justice system actually want him back to put him on trial? I mean, right or is now, it... no. Right yeah. now, no, because there are there, there, there you know there is no uh, warrant of arrest against him. But it it uh, there is an indication, Glenn. It's a very it leads up to a very interesting question. Uh, there is an interim order from the Supreme Court issued yesterday, preventing uh, former Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksha and former Finance Minister Basil Rajapaksha. These are presidential mm. siblings, right? Ex-president siblings, right. from right. traveling abroad till the 28th of July. So yeah. there are a lot of people do expect the protesters do expect there could be, uh, you know, the, the the law would play its part. The judicial system would, you know, come into, you know, come, come up with the next steps. And mm. there is a huge public expectation. Yeah. So what do you think happens now, finally, dear Rukshi? Do you see the protests quietening down in the short term? And if nothing really changes, they'll start again? I mean, where do you see Sri Lanka going from here in the short to medium term? If there is no uh, proper transparent election of the next president on 20th of July, and if people feel, and people feel this way, and I hear it a lot, if there are horse deals that are being struck, then there could always be a possibility of what we witnessed, the unrest we witnessed, uh, public anger that we have seen can recur. So that is quite possible. Uh, but people are also prudent. If you notice, barring a few incidents, people have been largely nonviolent. People yeah. have been protesting despite what they did not have. You know, they're basically going without essentials, but still people, you know, uh, came to places, sang songs, and there was this, uh, you know, a community, sense of community. P people expressed their anger, disappointment uh, in, in very peaceful ways. But I hope the politicians do not push them over the brink. Hmm. Yeah. 
Thank Dr. Rakshi, thank you so much for your, your time today. We know it's an evolving story and much that we don't know uh, about Absolutely. what the future will hold, but we certainly hope we can get you back uh, in coming weeks uh, to, to give us further updates. Uh, Dr. Rakshi Handanetti, Executive Director of the Center for Investigative Reporting in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Thanks for being with us today on Money FM Singapore. Thank you, Glenn and Neil.